We've learned so much about the Pidyon uh, Shvuyim, the loss of redeeming hostages. And it kind of it kind of hit me. I had a uh, memory back to when I was a teenager at my Yeshiva High School, BTA. Uh, for those of you that never went to Yeshiva High School, you may have an image of the boys at Yeshiva High School being really holy, angelic, saintly young men. And a lot of yeshiva high schools, that's really true, but not the one I went to. We were, we were kibitzers. We were characters. And we were, we wore yarmulkes, wore tzitzis, davened every day. We were, compared to what's out there in the rest of the world, we really were angelic. But in terms of what we should have been, and we had a lot of shtick, and I won't take too much time on the shtick, but one of the things if your image was that a nice modern Orthodox boy in yeshiva looks forward to sitting and learning Gemara every day, we every day tried to figure out how to get the Rebbe off topic. Because now I got into Gemara later on, after high school. After, after high school, I really missed it. I was at Columbia and I missed Gemara. But at the time, Gemara was basically, oh no, the more he teaches, the more it's going to be on the final exam. So we had this ongoing strategy every day. How can we get the Rebbe off topic? Of course, if we can get him really jazzed on a topic that's off topic, then he'll waste time. He won't learn. If we can do this all term, we'll have a manageable final exam because he won't be able to cover all the material he plans. And we might have a chance to pass it. Um, and so constantly in our day it was the Vietnam War. And no matter what he was teaching, someone would always raise his hand and say, how does this apply to the Vietnam War? Um, and there'd be something about if an ox knocks over another ox in a Gemara or if an ox knocks over the cart and someone would rest and say, I, Rebbe, I think I heard yesterday that an ox knocked over a cart in uh, Phnom Penh or in um, Hanoi. Uh, how, would, how would that apply to our Gemara? And the goal was to get him started on the, on the Vietnam War or on communism or anything we could talk about. And the Rebbe's were sharp. And they would say, oh, no, oh, no, you're not getting me off topic. Uh, we're sticking with the, we have an ox from 2,000 years ago and a cart from 2,000 years ago, and it's going to knock over flour from 2,000 years ago. Okay? We're not... When you find me the Gemara that talks about the Vietnam War, we'll cover that also. All right. So anyway, we developed a sense that is a little bit of it is not relevant because the Rebbe's wouldn't make it relevant. And Halakha is very relevant. And I was feeling a little bit this afternoon as I was preparing tonight's class. I was feeling, you know what? You're being like the Rebbe, uh, the Rebbe's. Uh, I learned the laws with you of Pidyon Shvuyim back when. And now here's the story of the of the, of the season. And it's sort of like, we're not going to go into that now because we already learned it. Now we're going to learn about the ox and the cart. And so what I want to do, I'm not at all going to go into the depth and detail that we went into during a four-week period learning Pidyon Shvuyim. But I want to do a little bit of refresher, a little bit of Pidyon Shvuyim refresher, and I'm going to tie it in, and we're going to talk about the six who were murdered this uh, the other day, and uh, we're going to we're going to bring it together, and then as with so many things, because and and here's the last point of the intro. A lot of times halacha is very clear. You're not allowed to turn the lights on on Shabbat. That's an easy one. You're not supposed to drive a car on Shabbat. That's an easy one. And then the question becomes, what if the wife is pregnant and going into labor on Shabbat? Oh. Oh. Well, if her life's in danger, yeah, but maybe her life's not in danger. Well, we'll assume her life is in danger. Okay. What if she goes into labor an hour before Shabbat's over? Can we wait an hour or two hours? Because my last child, my wife was in labor for 14 hours. I don't mean to make anybody wince now, um, but my wife was in labor 14 hours. That's so two hours. If my wife goes into labor two hours before Shabbat, can I wait two hours because probably didn't need to? No, no, you can't wait. But it takes analysis. All right. So, Rebbe, you're saying that I should drive my wife to sh on, on Shabbat, even though I'm not supposed to drive on Shabbat, if she goes into labor. Okay. 
So, Rebbe, I have a question. When I get to St. Luke's Hospital, that's where my kids were born in um, in Manhattan. Where what better place for a rabbi to have children than St. Luke? Um, so, when we get to St. Luke Hospital at four p.m. on Saturday afternoon, Shabbos, and I drop off my wife and whatever's cooking inside her, what do I do with the car? So, pikuach nefesh to save her life. I got to the hospital promptly. Now I'm at 114th or 116th, whatever it was, up on uh, Broadway or whatever it was. And uh, what do I do? Do I just walk out of the car? Because there's no more saving my life? Uh, do I drive the car? You can't park anywhere in, in, in Manhattan. So I'll have to go to a garage. What if I have to drive three blocks to find a garage? So the Rebbe said, because the Rebbe didn't have to quietly think about it and analyze, because he'd been through this question a thousand times already. He was a Rebbe in the 60s or 70s, one of the prominent post uh rabbinic authorities, and he'd obviously been asked this. He said, Dove, you drive the car to the parking lot. All right. And when I get to the parking lot, I got to come up with, in those days, $30. Today, I suppose you have to give them a house in order to get into park. But uh, Rebbe... Do I bring $30 cash? What do I do? And uh, he says, given that you know that you're not going to be able to get that car in without the $30, and given that you know you're not going to be able to leave the car alone if you don't bring it into a parking lot, and given that if you were told halachically, I don't mean you, Dove, but anyone who's told halachically that you can't park the car, many, many, many men it's not just men, it would be women. Many men will sit and analyze not to drive their wife to the hospital till Shabbos is over because they will be concerned about what's going to happen with their uh, $20,000 car. And so the halacha is you get in the car, you drive your wife, you drop her off the hospital, you find a garage, you park the car, you pay them, and shalom al Yisrael. Or you can, nowadays, you can arrange with an Uber in advance, well, not in advance, but you could try to arrange with a neighbor in advance where the neighbor, okay, why am I telling you this? First of all, I taught you halacha. And second of all, there's halacha and then there's analysis and there's application. It's very, very easy for me to teach you from Rambam that you have to save shvuyim. We have to save cost captives and hostages over everything else. It's like, number one, it's over Yom Kippur. It's over everything. You sell a Torah to save hostages. All the things we learned. There's no compromise in saving hostages. And then what happens if you have a situation, as we actually have in real life, where Netanyahu, a few years ago, 10 years ago, give or take, there was one single hostage I mean, he's a human being. What do we say? Every life is a world. Okay, you know who I mean, Shalit. Um, and for one hostage, well, everyone's talking about that it's a Jewish, it's a Jewish value. You have to do everything to save even one hostage. So we gave up over 1,000 Hamas convicted Arab terrorists just to save Gilad Shalit. And I, I would not blame the Shalit family for pressing the prime minister to do exactly that. If I were Shalit's relative, I would also press it. But the question is, there's one thing, if you're the relative demanding, give up a thousand Hamas terrorists for my so-and-so, my brother, my uncle, my but, And it's another thing, if you're the prime minister and you have a bigger picture. Well, you could have a bigger picture, but if you're a Jew, and if they tell you this is the Jewish requirement to give up a thousand murderers for one hostage, then you have to do it. But is that the requirement? Well, it says that you have to give up like everything for a hostage. But does it really mean that? Because we also learned when we learned Pidyon Shvuyim, we learned that there are certain limits. If, for example, the famous case of Rabbi Meir of Rothenberg, where the dictator, whether he was a tsar or he's a uh, emperor or king, whatever he was, uh, took the chief rabbi of Rothenburg and held him in prison unless the Jewish community would fork up a certain amount of money and let the community figure out how to raise it within their ghetto or whatever. But here's the price to free your chief rabbi. And people started, what are you going to do? You got to free the chief rabbi. 
I'm sure they probably first had had discussions. How many more years left on his contract? You know, if his contract's running out in May, maybe he's not going to be the chief rabbi. We'll negotiate for five months. Um, at some point, it was decided we've got, I mean, it was like no question we're going to, we're going to redeem him. And he gave it soft as the chief rabbi. He gave a halachic order from prison, do not redeem me. If you redeem me and you pay, they'll be kidnapping chief rabbis for all over the world. And it will never stop. I forbid you to raise money to redeem me. And he died in prison. And then they raised a much smaller amount, but they, the king said, I won't even let him out. I won't give you his body without a payment, a much, much lower payment. And they did raise the money to take out his body. So that's how complicated this is. You have to save, you don't save. And we also learned, if you'll recall, that it's a big mitzvah to try and go and rescue them, do a military operation to free the hostages. But then one has to analyze what will that what will that do for other hostages. And so with that intro, we're going to look at some text. We're going to get into this stuff today. Um, it's very hard times, but they always are. When were there not hard times? I could give you, I don't know, maybe like May 23rd, 1971 was a good day for Jews. I don't know. No, it couldn't have been because 3 million Soviet Jews were in prison at the time. So I guess that wasn't a good day. How about April 19th? No, Jews were being imprisoned in Iraq. Uh, so when was a very good day for Jews? Uh, April 16th, 1953. Okay, not a bad day. No Holocaust going on. No one being murdered. On the other hand, Jews couldn't get a job in a law firm. All the law firms barred Jews in the United States. All the good law firms would not let Jews in. So there's a lot of anti-Semitism. Okay, maybe 1931. How was that? How about October 16th, 1931? Well, that wasn't bad if you don't count that Hitler was rising up in Germany. So it's always been a bad time. And if you want to be a little optimistic, which I always am, we've never had our own country. Not for 2,000 years, never had an army that could do something about it. Never before had a situation where even with the whole world pressuring the Israeli government, they've got a prime minister who right now will not be pressured. Now, you could like this prime minister, not like the prime minister, but that's a heck of a thing. That's just a heck of a thing for a Jewish leader to be standing there and telling the leaders of Germany and France and England and the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, United Nations, to say, I hear all of you. You all have exactly the same message to me. And my answer is, I'm not budging. And go ahead and try me. Try me. An arrest warrant? Put out an arrest warrant. I'm not budging. That's an incredible thing. Let's get to work. We became absolutely certain that you were coming home to us alive. But it was not to be. Now I no longer have to worry about you. I know you are no longer in danger. Welcome back to GMA3. That's the mother of 23-year-old Israeli-American Hirsch Goldberg Poland, one of six Israeli hostages murdered in Gaza last week. The funerals for those hostages were held over the past two days. This, as we saw, the largest protests in Israel since the start of the war, including one outside of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's home. ABC News foreign correspondent Marcus Moore is there in Israel. And Marcus, I'm curious what the protesters and the families of these hostages are saying. And Okay, that's the rest of that is just politics. So that's how we started. So we were learning in Mishnah Torah, Matanot la Evyonim Perchet, chapter eight of gifts to the poor. That's how it's that's where it's um, codified or codified by Rambam. Pidyon Shvuyim Kodem Leparnasada Niyim Vilifsutan. It is an enormous, enormous Torah commandment to provide food and clothing to the poor. But freeing hostages comes before that. And as I said during the intro, there is no greater mitzvah in Judaism. Literally, I'm not saying it like as an ahagzama, an exaggeration. Literally from the Rambam, there is not for you mitzvah gedola, a greater mitzvah, kepidyon shvuyim, 
like redeeming hostages. Shahashavui hare hu bichlal horaivim, because a hostage falls into all the categories. You're supposed to give matanot le'evyonim, you're supposed to give gifts of food to the starving and clothing to the naked. Well, the captive is all of it. He's among the re'evim, he's starving, hatzmeim, thirsty, arumim, naked. We literally saw that in some of the pictures that just came out, how thin and emaciated they are, were, and they had nothing to drink. We heard it in the last films that so that the um, Hamas uh, sent out. And they were basically wearing the same clothes. They were allowed to wash once a month at best. And on top of all that, overriding even that, they're all in, at risk of death. What you would think is one of the most important of all Jewish laws is you're not allowed to eat on Yom Kippur. But in Sakanat Nafoshot, if someone's life is in danger, they consult the Rav, and the Rav consults the doctors, and if need be, they'll eat on Yom Kippur or Tisha B'Av. We were just talking about if a woman goes into labor, as doubtful as it is that she would die in labor, nevertheless, there's risk. Sakana, Sakana in danger of life. So we said, you can drive the car in Shabbat. We even said that's so important, they could go and keep driving, looking for an, a garage, and you can carry cash or plastic, whatever. And so all of that, all those categories, the starving, the thirsty, the naked, and those facing Im immediate death, that's the Shavui. That's the person who's hostage. And any Jew who turns his eyes away from a hostage needing redemption, Hareza over al that person violates the Torah commandment found in Deuteronomy 15, verse 7. If there is a poor Jew from among your brothers, in any of your gates, in other words, if anywhere in the land of Israel, there is a poor Jew, don't let your heart be hardened. And don't tighten your fist and your hand not to open it broadly to give something to your brother who's in need. Well, somebody who does not take an active involvement engagement on behalf of Pidyon Shvuyim redeeming the hostages, that person violates the Torah law of not hardening your heart and not closing your hand at their need and more. Another Torah law, lo ta'amoto, damreacha, you shall not stand idly by your brother's blood. And lo yirdenu beforech le'inecha. And he goes on, and Rambam citing all these mitzvahs, and there are positive mitzvahs that I just mentioned, forbid, uh, negative mitzvahs, negative commandments, uh, prohibitions. Not only is that person, by overlooking shvuyim, uh, committing sins, perpetrating sins, uh, of acts that are forbidden, but he's also, or she's also, violating positive commandments by not doing what must be done. There's a commandment, you have to open your hand to the poor person. And there's a commandment, and your brother, and it refers to your sister as well, shall live with you. And you shall love your brother as yourself. Your neighbor, your neighbor is yourself. So would you try to free yourself if God forbid you were captive? The commandment is you have to try to love your brother as yourself. And it just goes on. He quotes there from Proverbs, Mishle. And Ramam says there's so many messages involved. But in, and in case you missed it up here, that there's no greater mitzvah than Kippidyon Shvuim. He actually, and he's not redundant. He's redundant in the sense of listing eight different mitzvahs that are implied, but that's not redundant. That's citing eight different things. But here he's redundant, which is not his style, because it's a code of law. It's not a, it's not a political tract. Just as he wrote there, Ve'en l'cha mitzvah gedola, he ends again. Ve'en l'cha mitzvah rabah. Kippidyon Shvuim, there is no greater law, greater mitzvah, than redeeming 
And then it goes on and on. And we talked about it. So, as I said, I don't want to turn today into a repeat of what we did in so much depth over a four to five week period. So I'm actually running through it, believe it or not, if you weren't here earlier. Uh, and if you were, you recognize I'm actually running through it. They bring out, for example, Rambam brings out, if people raised money to build a synagogue and then someone's taken hostage, you have to take all the money from the building fund and apply it instead to free that guy. And if they bought stones and they started walls, he says, uh, you're not allowed to sell it for any purpose other than to free hostages and so on and so forth. On the other hand, he says, and this is so important in terms of where we're going today. You should not pay more to redeem hostages than the fair market value. Now, of course, again, we went into so much more detail in the past. I'm just sort of running through it now. Uh, first of all, what does that mean, fair market value? Obviously, it's not like you buy a house and Zillow sends out the fair market value of your house today. Or you open up uh, Edmunds or one of those car guide things, the fair market value of a 19, uh, of, of a 20, 22 Honda Accord. Uh, what's the fair market value of a Chevy? Uh, well, that's, I didn't mean that uh, that way. Uh, the word Chevy means prisoner. I don't mean a C-H-E-V-Y. What is the fair market value of a prisoner? That, that did. But there's an intuitive market value where you say they're asking too much, like what Rabbi Mayer of Rothenberg was saying. There is such a thing. With all respect to Gilad Shalit, and he did nothing wrong that he got himself taken hostage. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. He wasn't fooling around. It's not like he, it's not like there were signs, do not pass, you're at the border of Lebanon or of, of Gaza, do not pass. And then a guy decides to take a selfie for TikTok or Instagram while he's hanging from a mountain with one finger and before dying or whatever, uh, takes the great selfie. Uh, and so there he is trying to take a selfie in Gaza or Lebanon and gets himself kidnapped. And now it's a no, he didn't do that. He didn't do anything wrong. He was just at the wrong place, the wrong time. A tragedy. Nevertheless, is what is that a fair market value? As much as his life is an entire world, that's what's got to be decided. Rambam doesn't have an answer for you. Rabbis have to sit and discuss it. And they have to discuss it with generals and they have to discuss it with with prime ministers. And again, we went into much greater detail what kind of general and what kind of general is not applicable, et cetera. But there's got to be a fair market value here. Because otherwise, because it's an issue of tikkun olam, and we also went into a great deal about tikkun olam. We're not going to do that now either. But we learned that tikkun olam has nothing to do with social justice and, and tikkun magazine and the reform movement and all these, uh, the, the, the Black Lives Matter, and why are you involved with Black Lives Matter for tikkun olam? None of this nonsense. Tikkun olam is a halachic, a halachic concept that when you do something, it cannot have ramifications that will mess up the social order. And if you start paying yeter al demehan more than the fair market value, you are going to mess up the social order because you essentially will create a new market that never existed in hostage taking, in taking of Jewish hostages. If you pay a disproportionate amount, you will be motivating, incentivizing our enemies to go pursuing Jews to take them hostage. Furthermore, there's a real question, Rambam says, that in certain circumstances, we should not act to free them. We should not have physical, uh, in Rambam's time, there was no Israeli army. By Rambam's time was the 1100s. That's a thousand years since the exile and a thousand years before the new rise of a state, the third commonwealth. So the last thing in the world you're thinking about is an IDF, a Tzahal going and freeing Jews. But let's say uh, 10, 12 Jews who are more, more militant oriented uh, would get together and say, we're going to break this guy out. A uh, bunch of Jews in, I don't know, Rome, Spain, England, whatever, 
we're going to get together middle of the night. We're going to break in. We're going to get this guy out. Rambam says the halacha, and Rambam doesn't make it up. Rambam pulls it from halacha texts that preceded him, like the Mishnah and the Gemara. And we're doing it this way because it's quicker for right now. We went to Mishnah and Gemara when we learned it previously. We do not break out prisoners, hostages, because of tikkun olam, so as not to mess up the social order. Because otherwise, shalom yehiyu ha'oyvim machbidin aleyin et ha'ol umarbim b'shmiratam. Because if it comes out that they're holding Jewish hostages, and there's an incident where a bunch of Jews actually free some hostages, and the word gets out to the people holding Jewish hostages around the place, they other people will start getting tougher on the hostages they're holding, intensify the guarding, uh, making it more painful and oppressive. And so there's a very important balancing act. And that's the Rambam. And that brings us to Gaza. Now, for, refresh your memory, or maybe this first time you're looking at this map. What you basically have, this is Israel, and this is Israel. And Gaza is just on the side, along the Mediterranean Sea. And it's broken pretty well into five portions in this map. And it's not a bad breakdown, pretty good. The thing is, you've got northern Gaza is along where Sade wrote is, for example, um, southern Israel. But a lot of people think of Gaza as being Israel's southern border, and there's Gaza, and there's Israel. And a lot of people don't realize all this is also Israel. And during the October 7 Simchat Torah attack by Hamas that killed 1,200 Jews, they did not attack through the north. They did not attack, let's say, Stay Road. They came this away. And by the way, as you can, it was not just Hamas terrorists, but it was innocent Gaza civilians. Innocent, of course, quotation marks. That's where they came in with their paragliders and, and their, and their uh, Humvees and whatever they were driving. And they came in across and they took the hostages and they brought them in. So it's not like they just brought them in from here. They brought them in all over the place. And on top of that, they had the tunnels. So God knows where they are and where they were brought. So they're all over the place. Then Israel came in this ways. Israel did not come in that ways. When we've been following the war after October 7, the invasion, the response was not from this area per se. It was primarily coming in, and it was a north to south sweep. A north to south sweep. So it started, we heard of places called Bet Hanun, and uh, that's Arab Bet. Uh, Bet is also Arabic. And Jabalia was the big one. And people said Israel's never going to get past the north. Because Jabalia, they're all fortified and they've got, they live on top of each other and it's going to be a nar narrow streets. There'll be snipers and they're just going to be knocking off Israeli soldiers like they're in a shooting gallery. And to everybody's surprise, except for the people who planned this operation, if God forbid it ever would be needed, they just cut through it like butter. Then came the next section where everyone said the worst of all is going to be Gaza City. It's the capital city, the main city in Gaza, an entity unto itself. And that's the main, main urban community. And Israel's going to go in there. And those houses are built up, apartment buildings. They got people on the eighth floor, ninth floor, seventh floor with, with throwing rockets, uh, throwing grenades and shooting rifles. And they're, they're, going to, they're going to kill everybody. Israel's never going to get past Gaza City. It's going to be a bloodbath. And that's what everybody said. And they just cut through it like butter. And if you remember, it's hard to remember now, but when Israel went in after about, they waited about three weeks to get organized to go in and to train everybody. You're pulling in reservists, Smiluim, who hadn't really been on that kind of footing. And they needed about three weeks, four weeks to get all the reservists and get them kind of back, back into training. 
and uh, basic training, they just went through. And then came the middle section, Nusirat, his main place there, and uh, there was Dir Abalak, and uh, that was also quick. And then became the big, big thing, Khan Yunus and Rafa. Hebrew, they call it Rafiach. Uh, Khan Yunus, the region is called Khan Yunus for its capital city, Khan Yunus, and then Rafa region is for its capital. And now you begin remembering more and more. Israel's already halfway into Gaza. And then they, this is where everybody said that Sava is really going to be, they're really going to be mowed down. It's going to be a bloodbath, and they're going to kill hundreds of thousands of innocent Gaza civilians. There's no way that they won't. And, they're, and you remember this. This is not like ancient history. Uh, they cut through Khan Yunus pretty successfully with a minimum of casualties. The casualty count has been about one to one. For every terrorist, there's one civilian killed for every terrorist. Uh, we've learned in previous classes, as well as on the Sunday class, uh, when we had John, uh, the, the sections with John Spencer, who teaches urban warfare. He's the uh, chief professor of urban warfare at West Point. And we had several sections where we heard from John Spencer that from hundreds of wars, urban warfare data and statistics over the decades, and that the average is four to one, that for every targeted uh, enemy, four civilians get killed. Whether you're fighting the Nazis, you're fighting in Iraq, wherever you're fighting, the average is to every member of the enemy that you kill, four civilians get killed along the way. There's just no way to avoid that. This is the lowest civilian to, to terrorist ratio in the history of urban war. And that's not like, I'm just saying, that's we heard that from John Spencer several times. Uh, if there's been 30 to 40,000 dead, according to Hamas, mili uh, health ministry, and 15 to 17,000 of them are terrorists, that means it's been a one-to-one -one ratio. And by the way, and I hope to write about this at some point, it amazes me that if 30,000 or 40,000 have died, and half of them are terrorists, and half of them are killed by Israelis, innocent civilians. What gets me is it actually means that Gaza is the safest, healthiest place in the world to live. Because 40,000 people, if, if Hamas is giving us the honest numbers, which I don't believe, but take them, it means that 40,000 people have died in the last 10 months, half of them killed by the Israelis as terrorists, half of them civilians killed by Israelis. That means in the last 10 months, no one in Gaza has died of a heart attack, a car accident, a lung transplant, an interstitial lung disease, kidney cancer, liver cancer, stomach cancer, all the cancers, glioblastoma. Nobody's had, died of a car accident. Nobody has had a domestic quarrel where a husband killed a wife, a wife killed a husband, a kid killed both of them, they killed a kid. No honor killings in the last 10 months. No gays have been killed in the last 10 months. It's the safest place on earth. Just get the Israelis out. It's the one place on earth that nobody dies from anything. Old age, 100 years, 200, 300. Whether or not they're eating that yogurt that they used to eat in Russia with the Danon commercials, they don't die. All the deaths in the last 10 months either came terrorists or Israelis killing people. An amazing place. So we go, nobody points this out. So we continue. So, and then you went to Rafiach, and you remember Rafiach because that's the last one. That was the big one where Kamala Harris was saying, we looked at the maps and there's a million Arabs there and we've looked at the maps and there's nowhere that those million can go. The Israelis never, ever will be able to clear out those million. So it's going to be a bloodbath. And in two days, all million evacuated. No problem at all. Just as Israel had said. And that brings us to this line with the orange or whatever color you want to call it, rust, uh, borders on the gray of Egypt. And this is what is, oh, by the way, that's Yasser Arafat International Airport, uh, whatever that's worth. Uh, this border is referred to as the Philadelphia Corridor, or the Philadelphia 
without the aid corridor. It is the border between Gaza and Egypt. Israel maintains, because it's true, all of the weapons that get into Gaza and have been getting into Gaza and have gotten into Gaza for like the last 15 years since Ariel Sharon gave it up comes through here. Egypt maintains that as part of their peace agreement with Begin, between Sadat and Begin, part of it is they're supposed to maintain tight control over this border. The fact of the matter is, whether they're acting in good faith, let's assume that Al Sisi, their, their president or prime minister, whatever, is acting in good faith. The reality is, from 15 years' experience, is that the border guards, number one, take bribes. How well are they paid to be a border guard at Philadelphia Quarter? They take bribes. Others, when Hamas comes with the weapons, are told either you let it through or we'll murder you. And the guards know Hamas means it. So whether they're taking bribes or they're capitulating to threats, they let this stuff through. And already, already Israel has found something like more than a dozen tunnels underground between Rafiach and Egypt. So beyond everything else, you actually have this phenomenon of nonstop weapons coming in. So Israel's taking the position in the current, in the current uh, negotiations that we are not going to leave this quarter. Whatever we have to do, whatever peace agreement or ceasefire we come up with, if we leave this corridor for 42 days, which is the amount of time uh, a, a ceasefire, uh, like it would be for 40, 42 days, six weeks, in six weeks, the amount of weapons that will come through here will, what was the point of knocking out all their weapons and all, all their grenades and all, they'll just restock. And that's a major part of this. When people say we're 90% there, the deal is 90% there. Um, that's like saying a landlord is renting her apartment to a tenant and the deal is 90% done. We've agreed on the apartment. We've agreed on the this, the ad, the price. We've agreed on everything. The only thing is the tenant refuses to pay the money. But we're 90% there. The only thing missing is a check or a credit card account number. That's what it is. 90% there. So, with that understanding, and with that Rambam, I'm going to do something I normally don't do, and I'm going to actually present to you two perspectives. Uh, and, and this will be a chunk of today's class. Uh, one perspective is a 20-minute uh, speech that Netanyahu gave this week after the six were, were dead. And then I'm going to share with you words from his chief opponent, Benny Gantz, and from another of his chief opponents, uh, Victor Lieberman. And this is the debate. This brings us back to my original point in the introduction. We can have a law about Yom Kippur. Are you allowed to eat? Well, it takes analysis. We could have a law about not driving on Shabbat. What if the wife is labor, in labor? And what about the garage? And what about carrying money? And there's always reasonable minds can differ. Now, Netanyahu made a speech this uh this week, and, and I listened to this speech, uh, and I was thinking to myself, for those of you that come to Sunday class, uh, when I listen to the speech live, uh, I translate these speeches at Sunday class, but I don't, I'm not a, uh, I'm not like a United Nations uh, simultaneous translator who can translate as the words are being spoken. So I normally need to pause and catch up. And so, it, so I was afraid it's going to take a long time. And, and then I found this, that he reposted it with, with titles. And then notice how long the speech is, 22 minutes, 21 seconds. And you see it's in Hebrew. The amazing thing that you've got to say, no matter what you think about Netanyahu, different people have different opinions. They have never before had, and probably never again will have, a prime minister as effective at getting the message across to the Western world. 
no matter what people think of them. And so this is this is the version that is posted by his office. After I caught the speech live on Israeli television, he took the trouble to put the entire speech with titles. And then he took the same trouble to redo the entire speech word for word in English, not by type, but actually to do the whole speech all over again for the English media. And look how long the thing that got is that his Hebrew speech was 22 minutes and 21 seconds. And his English speech, word for word translation in English, speaking naturally, was just about 22 minutes and 21 seconds. So we're going to save a lot of time instead of my translating or asking you to read the captions. Uh, Here we go. It's unbelievable. 22 minutes, 21 seconds, 23 minutes. Same speech. Unbelievable. The first speech was for Israeli media, all their newspapers and television. And then he took 34 minutes of questions in Hebrew. Uh, I'm not taking that much time out of our class to play the uh, media interchange. What was fascinating is in the full version in English, he also took 34 minutes of English questions from the foreign media. Unbelievable. Good evening. Israel is experiencing days of horror, sorrow, and rage. A week ago, we experienced such horror. Yesterday, I visited in Ashkelon, the family of one of the hostages murdered in cold blood. A day earlier, I spoke to several of the families of these murdered hostages. It tears your heart out. I said to them that I'm sorry. I apologize that we, we didn't get them out. We worked so hard to get them. We were close, but we didn't. And they changed the torment of families worried about their loved ones to families grieving for their fallen beloved. That sentiment I know, because I belong to that family, but it's a horror. His brother, of course, was was the one uh, Sahal soldier killed on the uh, Uganda uh, rescue in 1976. Yonatan uh, uh, Netanyahu had led the uh, the rescue of those hostages. We also lost brave policemen and brave soldiers who are fighting in the Gaza front. And I embrace their families as well. All our people do. On October 7th, we experienced the worst savagery in this century. On October 7th, we experienced the worst savagery meted on the Jewish people since the Holocaust. These savages massacred our people, 1,200 civilians. They beheaded our men. They raped our women and then murdered them. They burned babies alive. They took 255 of our people hostages to their underground dungeons. That's a horror that the world saw and responded to initially. It's important that we remember it, but we were given a reminder, a terrible reminder. Last week, when these savages murdered 
Six of our hostages in cold blood. They riddled them with bullets. Then they shot each of them in the head. Some of them several times. And these are the savages, these are the terrorists that Iran implanted next to our border, as elsewhere, and we're committed to defeating them, to extirpating this evil from our midst. I want to talk to you today about some of the things that we must do to achieve that goal including the questions of the Philadelphic order. But before I do that, I want to give your readers and viewers some context, because often you see maps of Israel, you, you think it's a Goliath. Well, I'd like to give you first an overview of where Israel is. This is the Middle East, and this is the entire Arab world, and this is Israel. It's one of the world's tiniest countries. I give it the, you know, the thumb test. This is a big one, so you need a bigger thumb. But it's a tiny country. It's one of the tiniest countries on the planet. It's, I think, one-tenth of one percent of the territory of the Arab world. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe it's two-tenths of one percent. It goes from the river, the river is right here, that's the Jordan River, to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. So when Hamas is talking about liberating Palestine from the river to the sea, basically what they're saying is destroy Israel. And the entire width of this is probably around the width of the Washington Beltway. It's all together at its widest point, about 50 miles, right here. Tiny. And here's Gaza there. This is the red thing that you see here. That's Gaza. Now I want to zoom in. When I zoom in, remember how tiny this is. Remember the distances here. Now take a look. Here it is enlarged. This is Israel. This is the Mediterranean Sea. The Jordan River is right here. This is Egypt and the Sinai Desert. Now look at Gaza. Where is Gaza? Gaza is implanted in this tiny country, 30 miles from Tel Aviv, 40 miles from our capital, Jerusalem, 30 miles from Beersheba. These are three of Israel's largest cities. <clears throat> Gaza is within spitting distance to them. Israel, up to the disengagement agreement of 2005, Israel controlled this border under an agreement with uh, Egypt after the uh, Camp David peace accords. We controlled this part, which is called the Philadelphia Corridor, I'll talk to you about that in a minute, right down to a lot in the Red Sea. This was our border. And while there was, uh, um, I would say a, a minimal amount of terrorism that wasn't, it really didn't face, we didn't really face a big problem. Let's zoom in on that a bit more. Here's Gaza Strip enlarged. Again, this is the situation in Gaza before the disengagement of 2005. And the Gaza Strip is firmly under Israeli control. We control the uh, maritime border. You can't smuggle in weapons. They tried, but we stopped it. You control the land border and you control this border between the Sinai Desert, Egypt, and Gaza, the Gaza Strip. It's controlled, this is the Philadelphia Corridor, this is the Rafa crossing, controlled by the IDF. Now look at the distances from Gaza. It's four miles to another city in Israel called Ashkelon, where I visited that bereaved family yesterday. <laughs> it's a population of 170,000 people, they're four miles away. But some of our communities, like Kibbutz Be'eri, which was one of the hardest hit, is one mile away from Gaza. Kfar Aza is less than one mile away. It's literally walking distance, okay? And so as long as we control this, these communities, sometimes they were harassed by this rocket or that rocket, but it was marginal. We controlled the security situation. But something happened in 2005. Israel unilaterally disengaged from Gaza. It just went out. It took out everything. It took out the army. It stripped, uprooted communities, took out 10,000 people. The army left the Philadelphia Corridor. Here's what happened. This is Gaza after the disengagement. And Hamas 
now has a weapon smuggling operation nurtured by Iran, financed by Iran, supplied by Iran, delivered by Iran. And here's what happened. That Philadelphia corridor became completely porous. The other borders controlled by us. But once this was perforated, even though the policy of Egypt was to prevent it, I, you know, it didn't necessarily work. It didn't, it didn't succeed. And this border, once we left our side of the Philadelphia corridor, rockets went in, missiles went in, drones went in, ammo went in, weapons manufacturing equipment came in, tunnel drilling equipment came in. Once we got out, once we left the Philadelphia corridor, Iran could carry out its plan to turn Gaza into a base, a terrorist enclave that would endanger not only the communities around it, but would endanger Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Beersheba, the entire country of Israel. It became a huge terrorist base because we left that corridor. So we vowed, or I would say all this, you have to understand that the centrality, the centrality of the Philadelphia corridor to the arming of Gaza, to the arming of Hamas, and this all led to the October 7th massacre, which Hamas has vowed, proudly vowed, to do again and again and again. We vowed that they won't be able to do it. So we set, as far as Gaza is concerned, three war goals. The first war goal was to destroy Hamas's military and governing capabilities. The second was to free our hostages. And the third was to ensure that Gaza never again poses a threat to Israel. And all three of those goals, all three of them, go through Israel's control of the Philadelphia corridor. And it's obvious why. You want to destroy Hamas's uh, military and governing capabilities, you can't let Hamas rearm. It's obvious. So you have to control the corridor. You can't let them have, by the way, it's not only to prevent them from terrorizing us, attacking us, it's also to prevent Hamas or any other terrorist organization from terrorizing the people of Gaza. Gaza cannot have a future. If Gaza remains porous, and uh, you can enable rearmament of terrorists through the Philadelphia corridor. The second thing is to release the hostages. First of all, you can't prevent, if you leave this corridor, you can't prevent Hamas from uh, smug not only not smuggling weapons in, you can't prevent them from not smuggling terrorists, uh, hostages out. It's walking distance, nothing. They can uh, easily smuggle hostages out here to the Sinai Desert in Egypt, they disappear. It's crossing distance, the distance is nothing, it's meters, meters away. They cross the, uh, the barrier above ground, they don't even have to go underground. They disappear in the Sinai and then, then they end up in Iran or in, or in Yemen, they're gone forever. And you need something to squeeze them, to prevent them, to put pressure on them to release the remaining hostages. So if you want to release the hostages, You've got to control the Philadelphia corridor. And the third, reason, the third goal of ensuring that uh, we prevent Gaza from uh, uh, being again a threat to Israel, it's clear Gaza must be demilitarized. And it can only be demilitarized if the Philadelphia corridor remains under firm control and is not uh, a supply line for uh, armaments and for terror equipment. I think that's clear to uh, most Israelis, to all, all Israelis. But a question has arisen. That may be the case. <laughs> but why don't you leave Gaza for 42 days, you could come back. Well, aside from what I said, that they could smuggle the terrorists out. Why don't Obviously, in this book, he means smuggle the hostages out. Come back. I want to show you what they've got <laughs> under Gaza. I didn't show you that. So I want to show you that. This is what they have under the Philadelphia corridor. Just to so understand the supply lines we're talking about. This is one of the tunnels there. Look at the engineering. Look at the investment here. Look at what they've got. We've got dozens of such tunnels, dozens of such tunnels underneath the Philadelphia corridor. Uh, to give you a, an impression of the size of these things, 
This is a soldier. This is a tunnel. You could drive a truck through this. Yeah, indeed, you could. Here's a truck. Or it's a Humvee. This is a huge, huge problem. Now you're just going to walk away. It's obvious we have to control it, right? I think once you see this, you understand that. But then the next question is, okay, you leave and you come back. That's what they tell us. Okay. We'll have complete international legitimacy to come back. Sorry, we've gone down that route. We're down that route when we left Lebanon, and people said, you can leave Lebanon and you can come back. The first time they fire a rocket, you can come back. The world will support you. It didn't. And we've been out of Lebanon for 24 years. They said the same thing when we left Gaza in the disengagement. They said, you can leave. And the first rocket, I remember Sharon, Prime Minister Sharon said this to me. First rocket, above ground or below ground. We'll be able to go back in. It's been 20 years, we haven't gone back in. Because you all know and understand that the international community, including friendly countries under enormous domestic pressure because of the propaganda that's leveled against Israel and against them, there'll be enormous international pressure not to come back. What is their message? End the war. End the war. And so when we want to come back and resume, we'll pay an exorbitant price in many fields, including in the lives of our men, to come back. It's not a, just a military question. It's a military, political, strategic question. And we make that decision. We're not going to leave. 42 days, we're there. I don't want to leave in order to come back in when I know that we didn't come back in. And it's not going to take another 24 years to come back in. And God knows what price we'll have, how many more massacres, how many more kidnappings, how many more hostages, how many more rapes. It's not going to happen. So people said, yeah, but if you stay, this will kill the deal. And I say, such a deal will kill us. And there won't be a deal that way. This is a false narrative. I'm willing to make a deal. I made one already. One that brought back 150 hostages, 117 alive. And I'm committed to return the remaining 101. I'll do everything I can to get them in. But leaving Philadelphia does not advance the release of the hostages because the deal cannot be advanced. They'll, they'll keep, they'll give you a minor part, if they give anything, keep the rest. Go and argue. You know when they started giving us hostages? When we went into Philadelphia, when we went into Rafa, when we controlled the Rafa crossing, that's when they felt the pressure. As long as they didn't feel the pressure, they wouldn't do it. The first batch, the first deal that we got was a result of our invasion, the military pressure we put in. They gave us the hostages. After that, they thought, well, you know, we'll have the international pressure turn on Israel, so we won't have to do, we won't have to make any concessions. But after Rafah, their tune changed. And they began to change. If we leave Rafah, if we leave the Philadelphia quarter, there won't be any pressure. We won't get the hostages. I said I'm willing to make a deal. The real obstacle to making a deal is not Israel. And it's not me. It's Hamas. It's Sinwar. On uh, April 27th, I put forward a proposal by Israel, which uh, Secretary Blinken called extremely generous. On May 31st, having met Blinken again, I said we agreed to the U.S.-backed proposal, and Hamas refused. On August 16th, the U.S. For brought forth what they call the final bridging proposal. Again, we accepted, Hamas refused. On August 19th, Secretary Blinken said, Israel accepted the U.S. proposal, now Hamas has to do the same. 
On August 28th, that's a week ago, the deputy CIA director said, Israel showed seriousness in the negotiations. Now Hamas make the deal, must make the deal. This was last week. So I ask you, what has changed? What has changed in this week? What's changed is that they murdered six of our hostages in cold blood. Now the world will seriously demand that Israel make concessions after this massacre? What message is this sent to Hamas? I'll tell you what the message is. Murder more hostages, you'll get more concessions. That's not only illogical, it's not only immoral, it's downright insane. So it's not going to happen. We have red lines. Before the murder, they haven't changed. We'll hold to them. But we also have had flexibility. And I'll tell you one thing, Hamas will pay for this. That, that you can be assured. We'll make sure that we extract them, that uh, price from them. But we are firm on our red lines, including the Philadelphia corridor, for the reasons I described here. I'm flexible where I can be. I'm for when I have to be. I think there is a, the possibility of getting this deal if we stick to this strategy. I said before, we got 150 hostages out because we combined a firm stance with military pressure. And I said that Hamas, after that, relied on international pressure, but it had weakened. And then we went into Rafa in the Philadelphia corridor, so it got strengthened. And they were beginning to balk. A condition that they said they'd never accept, a red line, is that we must commit to getting out of Gaza and uh, uh, enabling Hamas basically to take over Gaza again. End the war, get out, let them retake Gaza. That's obviously something we couldn't do. They said there'll never be a deal. Well, they started caving in there after we took the Philadelphia corridor. And then they started backing off. You know why they waited? Why they started backing off? Because they waited for Iran to start a general war with Israel. That didn't happen. So then they waited for Hezbollah to start a general war with Israel. That didn't happen either. So now they resort to the final tactic. They're going to sow discord and create international pressure, again using the hostages, even after the murder. And this is something that's not new because they started this a year ago. You should see this. I mean. This is their tactic. This is Hamas orders for psychological warfare found in Hamas underground command post on January 29th. That's right after the beginning of the war, 2024. And this is, this is the original document in Arabic. Our soldiers found it. And here's what it says. Push photos and videos of hostages. Put it out in the media because that creates enormous psychological pressure. Who's not affected by it? Any human being seeing these, these souls, these girls, these, these, these people, young people from those dungeons, you're affected by it. Second, increase psychological pressure on defense minister. Third, continue blaming Netanyahu. And fourth, claim ground operation will not release hostages. That's Hamas's, not only, that's not only their talking points, it's their strategy. And their idea is, this will sow internal discord and increase international pressure on Israel. That's what they hope to achieve. And they hope, they think this will happen. Well, it won't happen. I can tell you why it won't happen. I'll tell you why they'll fail. Because overwhelmingly, the people of Israel are united. They understand everything that I said here. Overwhelmingly, you should know that. It's important. And the second thing is, we're committed to achieving our goals. All three goals. Destroying Hamas's military and governing capabilities, releasing all our hostages, and ensuring that Gaza does not become a threat to Israel anymore. And all these require standing firm on the things that will ensure the achievement of these goals. And with God's help, and with our people's will, and with the courage of our soldiers, we'll achieve all goals. 
So that that speaks for itself. And because and because Israel is a robust democracy, uh, the next day we in America know how it works. If you're on the other political party, whatever gets said, you're ready the next day with why everything's wrong. Anything Trump says, Harris will be out an hour later pointing out all the mistakes. Anything Harris says, Trump will be out at it. So I don't want to, we're, we're kind of past 7.30, so I want to keep it, I'm just going to give you a minute of Gantz and a minute of uh, Lieberman just to get a flavor of what goes on. But when you, at the end of class, consider what we learned today and refreshed in Rambam, consider the balancing issues and what you heard and what you'll hear. It's a very complicated case, but it's not nearly as clear cut, open and shut, as the Western left wing media make it sound or when they get Biden or Harris on for a 30 second clip about this war must end now or we demand a ceasefire now or the much more politic way. Free the hostages and we demand a ceasefire now. Um, it's very complicated. And this is the unspoken issue, the Philadelphia quarter and these concerns. So let's wrap it up real quickly. Just. Dan spoke about eight minutes. I'll just do like a minute of it because of the time factor. But I just want to give you a flavor of what goes on there. Uh, and it's a democracy. So, of course, people are going to disagree. If you haven't met him, this is Benny Gantz. Uh, there is no a eh sound in Hebrew. The patach is an a. Ah. So though it spells out Gantz, it's pronounced Gantz. Israel. Citizens of Israel. The time has come now to put an end to all the lies. He's referring to Netanyahu's speech. We find ourselves in a very difficult, severe war that is just for the security of Israel and her sovereignty. We have paid very severe, heavy, and painful price fighting this war. And, for my, and it is my sorrow that we yet will be paying a, more of a price. We all understand that we have no choice and we must win. So, so far he's on the same, but you know how politics works. You first throw in the things that we all can agree on, and then, then you go for the zinger. And I'm not taking sides per se, I'm just... I understand there's a very uh, difficult uh, debate in Israeli society on what is the best course to follow. And I also know that all Israeli citizens want to uh, get the hostages back. This is the Jewish, and this is what we learned at the beginning of class tonight with Rambam. This is the Jewish uh, morality, the Jewish, uh, the code. This is, this is the code of Judaism. You get your hostages back. We all understand that the murder and cold blood of our hostages, those six, uh, requires that Hamas pay a very steep price. Yesterday, the Prime Minister uh, made a speech, what I just played you. Some of his points are very worthwhile to consider, and some are absolute lies. But the Prime Minister did not give the public a full perspective or tell the truth. And I'm just going to stop in another moment, uh, but I just want you to appreciate both. This is, his, this is uh, Netanyahu's main opponent for Prime Minister if there's a new election. And this is what goes on there. And so even as Netanyahu has to face pressure from the European Union, United Nations, International Court, Biden and Harris, he's also got this guy uh, who is, he, who's a 
it, I mean, he's got a good heart. And he's he's a patriot of Israel. Also, let's not take that away. He's a general. He, he's a general in the army. And he's a patriot. The fact is, Netanyahu lied. He says he will not bring the hostages back alive. He will not, in truth, uh, uh, guard over our uh, southern border, the southern border. He will not succeed in bringing the uh, 100,000 Israelis living in Galil up north who have had to evacuate their homes because of the Lebanese situation, the Hezbollah shooting ro uh, rockets there. Uh, Netanyahu will not succeed in uh, creating a peaceful situation that allows those families to come back home. And Netanyahu will not succeed in preventing Iran from uh, creating a nuclear weapon. And, and with this, I'll stop for now. I just wanted to give you that flavor. Uh, he says, me personally, I'm not surprised by any of these failings because during the period of time that I was sitting in the war cabinet, there was a period where they had like a unity government and he from the opposition sat with Netanyahu as sort of co-leaders of the war cabinet during this war in Gaza. He says that Netanyahu was not as aggressive. And he goes on to say Netanyahu held back uh, a more aggressive position and approach uh, that he wanted to take. So you've got that. And then finally, one more guy. Uh, Avigdor Lieberman is the head of an important party. He's a Russian immigrant, came to the United States during the great Russia, came to Israel during the great Russian immigration, initially was the chief of staff of Netanyahu's prime minister office, and eventually had a falling, oh, first he, Netanyahu raised him, elevated him from chief of staff to a ministry, made a minister of defense at one point, but they had a falling out. And the way it works in Israel, as soon as you get angry, if you have any following at all, you start your own political party. Sort of a little bit like uh, Robert F. Kennedy, only Kennedy's mistake, or, or Perot, or uh, Ralph Nader, but there's not a tradition in America for third parties to get anywhere. In Israel, they normally have 20 to 25 political parties in every election, and about 12 get into the parliament. So it's not so unusual to have a party. And if, your name, if you have name recognition, you normally can pull it off. So anyway, Lieberman, very cleverly, when he got angry at Netanyahu and formed a party, well, what's going to be my way to get a party to actually get seats? There's now a million Russians that came here uh, in the last 10 years, he said, and there's no Russian party. So I will be the Russian party. And whether you're, whether you're left wing or right wing or up or down, our party speaks Russian. And we understand and we'll take care of your needs. If there are any particular needs that the Russian community has, we'll be there. So anyway, Lieberman's so uh, significant, the two main parties, and then Lieberman holds the balance of power. He has about 15 seats. So only a minute of Lieberman now, but he was a defense minister. And it's an interesting bird. We don't have time for it now. He's very right wing militaristic. He came out of Russia and he's a he's a no nonsense, tough son of a gun. And on the other hand, he hates religion with a passion. He came out of a communist world. You know, most of the Jews from the Soviet Union had no religion when they came to Israel. And he he came to a country where there's like no public transportation in Jerusalem on Shabbat and all the food is kosher. You can have a lot of non-kosher food, but there are certain rules like the hospitals are not supposed to have chametz and Pesach. And he can't stand that. His, the Russians can't stand the idea that one week a year you can't bring bread right into a government hospital. And, and, and especially important, the idea that the chief rabbinate has supervision over weddings and divorces. So he basically has whatever Russian, it's a Russian party. The Russians hate Arabs. They didn't have to deal with Arabs in Russia. They came here, they hate Arabs like a passion. And what little Russian Arabs they knew, Muslims are the Chechens who in, in the Soviet Union blow up schools and everything. So they hate Muslims with a passion. And secondly, they hate the chief rabbinate. So, but he all, but anyway, that's Lieberman. If he's in the government, the reason he's not in the government is he doesn't want to sit in a government that has religious parties. 
But if he ever can work out a deal with the religious parties, which he would, if the religious parties, the, the right wing ones, the, the Haredim would agree to have some of the boys go to the army, then he would join because he'll never agree to give up an inch of Judea Samaria. Long story. Uh, let's just give him a minute and and Shalom al Yisrael, as they say. And to see, he dresses like for the Russians. He's not wearing a suit and tie. He's not a candidate for prime minister. He's he's like a union guy. Only they're in, you know. Okay. Man, shemishu yagidatay met. Kol masherayinu v'shamanu itmo. If you know Hebrew well, you can hear his Russian accent. Israchay Israel. Citizens of Israel. Yagiazman. The time has come for someone to tell the truth. Mishahu, someone. Everything that we saw and heard yesterday in Netanyahu's speech, it's all a bunch of talk. If I would be today the Prime Minister of Israel, I would make a law, I'd I'd legislate a law, a law that in terms of, that will bring true uh, justice against the uh, terrorists and their supporters. I would take all of the terrorists and all of those that murdered Jews First, I would take all of them who are in our hands, having been taken captive in the course of this war, all those in our hands, I would take them and I would put them to justice. And that, in other words, he would have them all executed. Furthermore, it is absolutely incomprehensible to the human mind that all these terrorists that we've taken since October 7, whether we've caught them in southern Israel at the time of the attack, or we picked them up as prisoners of war after we went into Gaza and brought them to be in Israeli prisons, it is absolutely incomprehensible that we now give them food, unlimited food and energy and, and medicine also in Gaza, that we are supplying we are supplying food to Gaza and providing them with energy and providing them with medicines. This we have to stop immediately. No more food into Gaza, no more energy into Gaza, no more medicine into Gaza. These are the steps we must take immediately. We can't continue just with words. We can't just continue with press conferences. We have to do, we have to do a deed. Enough words, time for action. So that's what's going on. That's, uh, he's got pressure on both sides. And it's important to know. And with that, uh, we're wrapping up today. Thank you very much. So take away short and sweet ethics and values of Jews during war. These are the challenges, and these are the different schools of thought. Netanyahu is kind of in the middle, and Gantz is a little bit to his left, and Lieberman is in certain ways to the right. And this is what Netanyahu, so you don't pick this up in the Western media. You see that they like to pick up in the Western media that 100,000 Israeli leftists hold a demonstration every Saturday night to take down the government, which is their right. But they don't point out that, let's say, 9,800,000 didn't go to the demonstration. And that in Israel, unlike America, it is very common to have demonstrations of 100,000. In America, when 100,000 people march in Washington, it's a thing. It's not it's not unknown, but it's a thing. In Israel, 100,000 person demonstrations are very, very common. The Haredim come out 100,000 every time there's a threat that they're going to get drafted to the army. Uh, there are all kind. Now, why do they have so many? Partly, it's a different culture. It's a culture of people coming into the street to tear down governments. Why? 
because in the United States, when the government is elected, for better and for worse, the government stays four years. In those British style cabinet, um, British style governments can be torn down at any time. If you can get the public to pressure the prime minister to step down before his or her uh, term of office ends. So we've just seen in England, Boris Johnson stepped down, uh, Rishi Sunyak stepped down, in France, the guy stepped down, Macron or whatever. Uh, and therefore, it kind of, outside of America, there's a greater feed to have massive demonstrations to tear down the government, because you might actually get somewhere. Whereas with America, it's not. The other reason you get 100,000 people demonstration is that it takes 20 minutes to get to the demonstration. When there was a demonstration of 300,000 Jews in Washington, D.C., uh, Denise, on behalf of our shul, bought a ticket, flew, had to get to the airport, had to fly from the airport to that, to D.C., had to get from the airport to the thing, had to, had to, had to have a hotel room. It's a whole geschichte. On the other hand, when you want to go to a demonstration in Tel Aviv, wherever you are, it's a 15-minute bus ride, half an hour bus ride. It's no airports. It's no bus ports. Just bring a little bit of change, and you get on a bus, which is running anyway, and everybody else is on the bus. And so it doesn't mean the same thing. That's why tonight I wanted to share with you also, like, what's going on? And what is Netanyahu really dealing with? The issues that he brought up, and he's got pressure internally from, from um, Gantz on the left and from Lieberman on the right. And uh, next week we go back to Rambam. 